about Nancy Pelosi making a visit to Korea and the Chinese threatened to shoot her plane out of the sky. I'm just disappointed that they didn't. <laughs> well, she went to Taiwan. But so relations between the United States and China have not been great lately. Taiwan, right? thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So what do we do? We send an 82-year-old narcissist over to Taiwan. Sociopath. Yes, totally <laughs> makes sense. Right? So you remember a couple of weeks ago, she was in Italy, right? Because she went she, to the Pope so she yeah. could get her. Well, she got exonerated. Have her community, yeah. right. uh, and communion. she just had to make that trip because she just had to hand this check for $500,000 to this organization, right? But what had happened right before she it cost her more than that to take her entourage True. Yes. on the plane. Yes. But what happened right before she went to Italy? Right. Her husband got caught. DUI. Yeah. Right? And now it's come out that not only was he drinking, he had drugs in his system, and he handed the policeman a special card that said he was exempt from the police. Mm. But also, that's one. Two, that's one. Right? Number two was that she was well, refused communion by her diocese. Right. Yes. So, so, she, so the, the, deal, the trip to Italy served a double purpose. Got her communion from the Pope. And kind of took the eye off of her husband. Because right? of her position on abortion, right? Right, yeah. So she's pro-abortion, and, and the archbishop said you can't, right. you can't be promoting abortion. abortion and be a Catholic. Right, but and you know the communion. Pope, right? The but lefty. amazingly, she received the blessings, and she received communion right. yeah. at the hands of Francis. So this week what comes out is that her husband miraculously bought and sold stocks right before the right. you know this the congress was going to was going to vote on right. a communications bill right so martha stewart wanted that card that said you're exempt yeah. from the police yep so what do you do when all that is coming out that your husband was drinking that your husband well i would be drinking if she was my <laughs> wife too <laughs> <laughs> that your husband was doing drugs that he was better than you and I because he has a card to make him exempt from the police. Oh, and by the way, we're going to do insider trading, right? So what do you do? You go to Southeast Asia and you go to Taiwan, right? Which put the Chinese, made the Chinese go insane, right? They were super angry. They, they called yes. her a witch. Okay. <laughs> China did. Yes. One of the protest signs said, Nancy Pelosi, you witch, go home, or something like that. But, and then, she, you know. Somebody she, spoke some pretty good English. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So she landed in Taiwan in the dead of night. She got her little pictures, her photos, right, her uh, right. photo ops, photo. and then she flew back. So what's happening now in the South China Seas, right? China has now become very aggressive towards Taiwan. They are on the verge. Yeah, she helped. Exactly. They're yeah. on the verge of war. And I mean, I'm the first person to say we should be supporting democracies, but not for this reason, right? We all know it was a cover up for her to distract well, people from what right. was going on. I sense on. There, there's more to, you, you're right in what you've identified, but I think there's more to it than that. I think there's much more to it than that. Uh, exactly what it is, I can't, I can't. I can't I can't extrapolate from, from the current set of events, but I think there's more to it. Well, and it could, you're right. It could be, hey, China wants to invade Taiwan and they need an excuse. Let's, let's let Nancy Pelosi go over there and stir uh, the pot, right? Could it could be, be that. Could be. You never know because since Double the Biden, jeopardy. yeah, the Biden family's making millions off of the Chinese. Yes, I just, how did we get, you know, the, the framers of the Constitution and the founders of this country considering that someone like Nancy Pelosi and her husband, you know, the, the phrase, the phrase tarred and feathered comes to mind mm -hmm. because that's exactly, yep. or worse, actually, what they would have done to someone like that, yep. a family like that, um, tarred and feathered, at least they would have been driven out of town. This is, this lady is so out of touch. You remember during COVID and her two massive sub-zero refrigerators, one of which was filled <laughs> with ice cream, God. right? So here people are locked away because of COVID and 
She's this is featuring she, her yes. ice cream. Yes. <sighs> She How did makes we ice, get here? She makes ice cream? No, no, no. She just no. had a refrigerator full very of ice cream. Very expensive ice cream. Very yeah. expensive. How did... I give her credit that she's thin and that she's probably not eating it, but then it <laughs> begs the question, why do you have it at all? And, and what about when she went to the hairdresser during the oh, throes yes. of COVID? Yes. Uh, I just... Why is she even there? Why, why does she exist yep. in Congress? <laughs> yep. Beats me, but it's getting interesting because I hear that um, pencil neck geek Schiff wants her job. So. Schiff. Oh, good. So it'll be interesting. Shifty. Yes. And then in other wonderful news out of D.C. So the Biden administration is trying to do all they can to make tra trans and LGBTQ issues, you know, the heart of the Democratic platform, right? So we have Title IX, which traditionally has been reserved for women in sports, how to get you right, know, funding right. for women in sports and things like that. So in trying to force schools to, allow, to basically teach the LGBTQ propaganda, they have decided that they are going to tie school lunch money funding to Title IX. Their new Title IX, right? The new Title IX that refers to LGBTQ, not women. Give us an understanding of what Title IX is. Okay, so one of the problems that occurs primarily in college sports is men's sports get lots and lots of money naturally from, you know, donors. Um, football just makes Football's oodles huge. of money. Right. Oodles of money, right? And football tends, tends to help fund other sports at the school, but only to a certain point. Right. Women's sport, because... Frankly, we just don't draw people, you know, we don't draw a stadium full of people to watch women's volleyball or right. basketball. You know, track basketball right. um, needs money. So they created Title IX to help balance out the amount of money that women's sports would get versus men's sports, right? You know, to help fund women's sports and help keep women's sports going. Right. But with the big rush of trans people trying to compete in women's sports, which for me, this is a I teach sports. I, at one point, I was a coach of both softball and volleyball, so I really resent trans in, in women's sports, sure. right? It is very difficult for women. There's limited number of scholarships, and now there are, in essence, genetic men coming in and taking those things from the women. Right, right. right? Co college scholarships. Yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. So now you're not just competing against women around you, some of which are better than you, some are, you're now competing against men. Right. So anyway. Only they say they're not men. Right. They claim today I'm a woman. Never mind that XY or XX chromosome in me, right? Right. So because the Biden administration is, is tying Title IX money, I mean lunch money to Title IX, schools that don't teach the LBGTQ um, propaganda right. would be in trouble. Number one type of school that that would happen to would be private, private Christian, Christian schools. schools. Private Christian school. So there is a school. Be interesting. Mm -hmm. I just thought of this. You know, every mosque, just about every mosque, mm -hmm. has a school associated with it. Is that going to apply to the the, the Muslim schools? Right. Yeah. Good question. It should, right? Mm -hmm. But I don't know. So I'm not in the system anymore. I taught for 25 years, but but. I, if, if I was in the position of trying to implement something like that, I wouldn't go after lunch money because it hurts children. Right. It hurts children. Right. I'd go after grants and scholarships. Yeah. yeah. And so Grant Park Christian Academy in Tampa has now sued the Biden administration over this issue. So more to come. We'll see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. But, every, but you're right. Every religiously affiliated school whether christian or muslim theoretically this would apply to every one of them right hmm. if it's equitable right right yeah okay um what other stunning great news you have for us <laughs> i actually do have some good news good. today but um i heard that ben and jerry uh their sales are oh down 40 yes percent in Israel. yes isn't that great wow <laughs> not i don't i don't buy ben and jerry's but hey that's good. I'm good to hear. I'm glad to hear that their sales are down. You know, you insult your market. Yeah. Don't expect them to buy you. <laughs> you know, ice cream's another can of worms over in Israel because they don't mix dairy with with meat. Right. 
And so uh, they're very careful with how they present that. An awful lot of, when you buy ice cream in Israel, it's usually, it's usually uh, sheep, sheep milk. Mm. Well, Ben and Jerry's ice cream that's sold in Israel is made in Israel. They, there's a plant it, in I, Israel. It almost has to be yeah. to be kosher. Yeah. So anyway, um, and more bad news. So we all know monkeypox and the WHO claiming it's a pandemic. And um, New York and California are now claiming it's a pandemic. And we all remember when COVID was declared a pandemic, right? What happened? Businesses were shut. Yeah. Children were kept from going to schools. They're Churches asking for a closed. problem with this one because the world's been shut down and everybody's going, we're not going there again. I'm, I'm confident. Mm -hmm. So, but we, but monkeypox presents itself in gay men, right? right having right. promiscuous, risky sexual relationships. So San Francisco, that beacon of morality. Yeah has an annual kink and fetish festival. And I'm not, I'm not even gonna go into what the activities are because it's, it's just too much. But there is a senator, Senator Scott Weiner, he's a Democrat representing San Francisco, who feels that the government isn't doing enough. It's the government's fault because they don't have a vaccine. And he's claiming that Asking to close bathhouses or asking gay men to abstain from sex is sex shaming. The quote is, lecturing people not to have sex isn't a public health strategy. It didn't stop HIV. It made it worse, and it won't stop monkeypox. What will work is vaccination, testing, and education. Mm. So, and even the San Francisco Health Department, or as they call it, San Francisco AIDS found, um, found provided guidance for monkeypox, right? And again, don't tell people not to engage in risky behavior. Don't close bathhouses because their lifestyle is above everything. Do you foresee a time, and I do, I'm just asking you guys and yeah. presenting this to, the, to our viewers, Perhaps there comes a time when if you reject the protocols of, of the response that the WHO is trying to put on the world with monkeypox, you can be sex shaming. Oh, yes. You can be That's accused of saying. being anti-gay mm -hmm. because you're not wanting to yield to all of the new protocols concerning this new pandemic that's being promoted. You think that's possible? Oh, yes. I mean, that's where they're going, right? Because So if the restaurant across the street says, you know what, we're not concerned about monkeypox. We're not going to embrace any of your protocols. We're just going to continue business as usual. Could they be accused of being anti-gay? No, I think what will happen is... Be stigmatized that way. So, so the reason that they're, they're so dead set on you know, calling because it's called monkeypox and in the past it's been associated with this type of behavior. Is, yeah. They're trying to rename it. It's because they want to create the illusion of normalcy. You normalize it. Right. But it's the, the stigma, the stigma is attached. It's already right. there. Mm -hmm. So I could foresee a time and, and a sentiment that would say, well, the only reason you don't want to surrender to, because you don't believe that you will contract this because you're not Oh, I could see that happening, but first, the homosexual community right now is refusing to follow any protocols, right? They want to continue their, their lifestyle. Yeah. So, but as soon as they decide to accept the protocols, that scenario that you just put out would happen, absolutely. Mm. So. Yeah, I could see that. Okay, now over to the Middle East. Mm. I'm sorry, I just don't have happy news. I just, I, mean, I really tried. I really tried. That's why you make the big bucks here. <laughs> <laughs> so this is something you would not hear anywhere in the mainstream media, right? Okay. This is from the Gatestone Institute for International Policy. And it's an article about how Palestinians in the Gaza Strip are committing suicide basically because of the amount of corruption that is happening 
with well, them. they're poverty stricken because the money's right. not flowing down the channel from the top. Yep. So in 2017, they started a protest with the slogan, We Want to Live. And this was not a protest directed at Israel. Israeli. It was a protest directly at, directed at Hamas. Their and, leadership. Right, their leadership and the PLO. Um, th the issue is, I think, in last year in alone, UAE alone gave $3 billion dollars to Hamas and the Palestinian Authority in Gaza. And that's not counting the 300 they're, billion they're that we They're buying rockets from Russia. Right, right. Well, there's corruption. You know, I've, we've, dri we've driven through some of the Palestinian areas in Israel. Sure. And one of the stunning things that you witness when you go through is that there's always, there, there are always those incredibly lavish mansions on the hilltops. Right. Mm -hmm. And down in the valley, you have the people that are living in squabble. But you have this, these incredibly lavish mansions uh, there in Israel. And, and, and every Israeli, and even Palestinian, knows very well that the corruption is as such that certain people, they, they, they manage to, to keep most right. of the money. Yep. And the corruption is in high places, the, the actual pa so-called Palestinians, they receive nothing. And only the people that are privileged to handle the funding that's coming in are the ones that are receiving the, uh, yep. the money. And there's corruption. Yep. But the media, CNN and MSNBC, will never feature right. a story like exactly. this because it doesn't follow with their narrative. Yeah, yeah. in their We Want to Live um, protest slogan, they said that it was a cry against taxes, extortion, repression, and corruption. It's, it's, and they're right. Yeah. It's, but it's so those no evil Israelis will touch, that no are hurting. Will touch yeah, that nobody's news. gonna gonna admit to that. Yeah, it's amazing. Okay, and in ultra strange news, the mainstream media is now advocating cannibalism as a great way to fight climate change. Talk about that. When you say the mainstream media, who? What the organizations? The New York Times. The New York Times. Yeah, mainstream, can't get main, more mainstream How than the New York Times. How were they advocating this? What, what did they do? They actually wrote an opinion piece saying that um, they were suggesting that the time is now for cannibalism. You know what that says, that they've been waiting for this time. There's been an opinion about this issue, and now is the right time. Yes. Why is now the right time? Because things are falling apart in the world, and that's the image they want to get. Well, they, they believe that cannibalism is more sustainable than the meat industry. This is, this is how perverted... I don't know. There have been a, cat, a cattle on a thousand hills for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Sustainable growth. Yes. Don't you just love absolutely. it? Agenda 21. And for them, it works twice as good, right? Because they think it, it's less of a carbon footprint to eat people than cattle, and it lowers the population, which is what they're well, after. People that would propose such a thing in, in not that long ago would be, would be referred to as an insane asylum. Yep. That's just, that's just sick stuff. And who hands them a microphone? Who gives them a voice that they should spew their opinion at the rest of us and that we should even listen to well, them? Well, right. the answer to that question has to do with how high up this corruption goes. Right, yep. right. Yep. It exists, it, let me say this without going too far, it exists in the highest plateaus of this civilization, of the American society. Cannibalism it's is... It's kind of not civilized, really. Can, right. Cannibalism yeah. is, a, is a reality, has been a reality for a long time. Ah. Okay, I'm going to go to happy news because it's just too much. <laughs> well, it's, what it's still kind of shocking. What you yeah. just presented is shocking. <laughs> yeah. Yes. But... I'm not surprised by it. Uh, it was a shock and awe moment. It, it was. I mean, uh, okay. Um, so yesterday was primary, primary day in right. many states. Um, Kansas, Missouri, Michigan, Pennsylvania. So there's like six states that had primaries yesterday. Yesterday was. Yes. Yeah. Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, Tuesday. Um, in the state of Michigan, there were two people vying for one of the congressional seats. Um, one is the incumbent who has held that his, either he or a member of his family 
has held that congressional seat since 1979. The clear, interesting, and that was um, Andy Levine. The interesting thing is Mr. Levine has been a Israeli-hating Jew the entire time he's been in Congress, right? He so lines up. That means he hates the state of Israel. Mm -hmm. He hates the fact that Israel is a state he thinks Jews should be continued to be dispersed yep. around mm -hmm. the world. Yep. He has said things like, um, so he was, he wanted the two state solution. You know, that, right. that was his big backing thing. They have no other answer. Mm -hmm. um, he also had, um, he lines up with Rashida Tlaib on most issues. They're, they're big pals. They've, They've done um, campaigning together, that kind of stuff. So Mr. Levine was opposed by another Jew, Mr. Haley Stevens. He is the opposite end of the spectrum. He is an Israeli-loving Jew who was supported by APAC, which is a right-wing Jewish um, PAC, right, that, that supports. And, and APAC went and poured a lot of money into Michigan to get Mr. Stevens elected. And last night... Because it brought down a dynasty also. Exactly. Right. So not only did they weaken the congressional side that has been anti-Israel, they got rid of a dynasty. So last night, Mr. Stevens defeated Mr. Levine, and we now have a win-win because whether mm. the Republican wins that seat or the Democrat wins that seat, which is probably more li most likely because it's Michigan. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> there will still be a supporter of Israel in Congress. Right. So how did the, the primaries go in general? It was very interesting. So the so big winner, in my opinion, in the primaries was Donald Trump because everybody that he backed ah. got elected. Except for, I think it was Missouri, where both candidates, both, both um, Republican candidates were named Eric. And rather than say... I, I heard I, it. Yeah. I, heard I, it. I back Eric. I H, back Eric, and there's two Eric. I back Eric, and it just drove everybody crazy. So because probably, <laughs> since he's over 70, he had that moment of, I can't remember his last name. Or so he I just, just felt like playing with him, right? Because right. that, was, that was like for two days, that's all they would talk about was which Eric did he back. So, and, and whichever so not, Eric, Eric won. <laughs> not to bring up a sore subject, but Kansas was in the heat because they were, they were litigating uh, uh, laws concerning abortion. Yes, and unfortunately they went the pro-abortion. Right. Yeah. No, that doesn't surprise me. I've been to, I'm sorry, <laughs> I've been to Kansas. So. <laughs> but, you know. It's, it's kind of desolate. Yeah. So, so they were the first state to go pro-abortion since Roe Wade was right, pulled back. Right. So, that's a state's choice. Yes. Right. Yeah. So that's my good news for today. Okay. <laughs> Hot dog. Well, we have a question, and it's a very good question, and and I'm interested in hearing how you respond to it, Pastor. The Apostle Paul referred to the fruit of the flesh which we immediately relate to sensuality, but of course it goes beyond sensuality. Could you give your perspective on the fruit of the flesh in contrast to the fruit of the spirit? Okay, all right. Uh, we've addressed this before, but it's, it's worthy to be considered again. Sure. Uh, okay, so the fruit of the flesh. Now, yes, it's, it's true. Many people, when they hear of the fruit of the flesh, they immediately consider you know, sensuality. Because, and why is that? Because sensuality is such a profound denominator in the human experience, right? You have, a, you have industries, not one industry, but many industries that centers around sensuality. And it's always been that way, right? It's always been a part, even of our ancient religions, part of the ancient religious systems, you know, the worship of Baal and Ishtar, and even, even the Molech involved sensuality. Now, yes, the fruit of the flesh goes way, way beyond sensuality, and it, it goes to places that are deep, deep, deeply connected to the human soul, to the human being. Uh, we're talking about, actually, the essence of the sin of Satan. It, that's where the fruit of the, fruit of mm -hmm. the flesh really come from. Uh, he introduced the iniquity in his rebellion that man embraced, and when did we embrace his iniquity, and be, and when were we, when were we affected by his iniquity? Well, when Adam 
transgressed. When right. Adam sinned against God, at that, at that point, all of humanity became affected by Satan's iniquity. So the fruit of the flesh is really, just to, just to capture this, is really the sin of Satan. Satan's sin is, in fact, the fruit of the flesh. And when we embrace uh, iniquity, when we embrace his iniquity, we manifest the fruit of the flesh. So in this case, you can blame the devil. Right. right? The devil made me do it. Mm -hmm. so, right. Sort of in this case. But that's, that's of course, we know it's a cop out. The devil made me. You can blame, right. you can blame the devil, but you really, you really have to consider our own choices. Right? So you have a question that we will look at next week, which is, can God change his mind? The, answer, the, the short answer to that is yes, but it really has to do with free will that he has given to man. And maybe I can address the question now. <laughs> can God change his mind? Yes, of course, God can do anything he wants. But God has already determined a covenant that's been cut, mm -hmm. paid for or provided for by blood. Abraham, that covenant. Uh, Noah. Noah made sacrifices, we know that. Right. Sure. When the eight came down on that ark, there were animals that were kept for sacrifices. Right. Clean animals. Mm -hmm. And so we're talking about covenants that's been provided for by blood. God takes blood seriously because the life of the flesh is in the blood. Mm -hmm. So what covenant did he cut with Noah and his sons? That he will not destroy the world again right. with a fire. So will God change his mind on that? He can. He can, but is he faithful? Yes, he is. And Absolutely. And so we can be sure that he will yeah. not change his mind on that issue as it relates to Abraham, mm -hmm. that covenant that was provided for by blood. He will not. In fact, we see in, in, uh, in, in Numbers where God determined, because of the rebellion of Israel, we're going off on a whole tangent here. We'll, yeah. we'll, 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 we'll come back. We'll snap it back to, to where we are right now. We see that. God oh, yes. determined that because of Israel's sin, he was going to bring the nation of Israel through Moses. Right. Yes. And he was going to wipe was, them out. Was he unfaithful to his covenant with Abraham? No. Right. Abraham and his descendants. And then it would have been from Moses Jacob on. to Moses. Right. Right. Okay. God was prepared to do this, but he was being faithful to his covenant with Abraham. Mm hmm. But Moses intervened, he interceded for the people, and he represented a good picture of Messiah, and God said, okay, I've changed my mind again. <laughs> but he was being faithful to the promise that he had already made to Abraham. So the Bible tells us that, Paul said it in, in Romans chapter 11, that the gifts and callings are irrevocable. So when, when God provides a covenant, he's not going to renege on that covenant. He's not a man that he should lie. He's not going to disappoint. But he can change his mind at any time. Mm -hmm. So what does that have to do with the discussion right now? Right? When man chooses to transgress against God, man is doing that by his own free will. Because of free will, God can change his mind about each of us individually. Mm. Because of our choices. Because of the choices we make. So the fruit of the flesh that we manifest come as a result of choices based on this this sort of an infection that the human soul the fallen soul has with the sin of satan so all of the fruit of the flesh really originated with satan we inherited that when we embraced his iniquity which is rebellion so it's so when 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 god created the flood right Right. Humanity had, the sin level of humanity had reached such a height, right? That it wasn't just humanity, it was also the, the fallen angels the, right. the, and yes. the Nephilim yes. as well. Yes. The sons of God and the Nephilim. Yes. So he basically brings on this flood, which sort of keeps the pot from boiling over, right? It brings, mm -hmm. it brings iniquity down to, to a very low level because there's only one family left. Right. He limits the extent of evil that was occurring before the flood and the potential for greater evil in the future by bringing a flood. Okay, but that, that fleshly thing is so endemic in us that even though we see Noah, the godly man that stood 
when everything around him was going crazy, right? When, when all evil was happening around him, he stood. And then he comes to the other side, and he, can't, he and his family can't contain that, right? It's still in them. Right. The, 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 the fallen nature is, like you said, endemic within humanity. We're, we're locked in. Right. And not until all is accomplished at the end of the redemption, redemption process, which is the new creation. So this, this is going to plague humanity until the new creation. So question there. Mm -hmm. Jesus comes and is reigning for a thousand years. Right. This is still going to plague humanity. Absolutely. Right. We see that at the end of the millennial kingdom, that there is the Gog and Magog conflict, which comes at the end of the millennial kingdom. So, yeah, the, 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 effect, of the, the effect of Satan's iniquity continues to work in humanity up until that point. The great, white, right. the great white throne judgment is what puts an end to it. So I think that's why Jesus rules with a rod, right? With a rod of iron. During the millennial kingdom. And people don't remember that. <laughs> well, he's coming to rule with a rod of iron, yeah. for sure. We see that in Revelation chapter 19, you know, two-edged sword, king of kings and lord of lords, to press the, the wine press of the fierce wrath. So yes, his kingdom would be a dominating kingdom, mm -hmm. an imperial kingdom yep. in the earth for a thousand years. But the rebellion only comes at the end of the thousand years. So that says for most of the thousand years, uh, there is a, a, a utopian type, a surrendered right. people to, to the great King Jesus and his bride who are working alongside him, the holy priesthood. So, but let's, let's consider now the essence of the iniquity that works within each of us that originated with Satan. So, in Ezekiel, Jim, yep. we're going to begin to see the fruit of the flesh reflected in the sin of Satan. Uh, perhaps we should go to Isaiah 14 first. Okay. Uh, Isaiah comes before Ezekiel. So, in Isaiah chapter 14, 12 to 14, Isaiah here, the prophet, is addressing the king of Babylon that would not come until another 150 years in the future from his point in time. But he's speaking to this great king who some believe is, he's referring to Nebuchadnezzar. I believe he's referring actually beyond Nebuchadnezzar to the future Babylon and the future uh, uh -huh. reign that will come. But perhaps he was speaking to perhaps Nebuchadnezzar, father of Nebuchadnezzar, or even Belteshazzar, grandson of, uh, but nevertheless. Right. So he's referring to this human being and suddenly in his discourse, it turns from the human being, and it becomes a, clearly a, an angel. Right. right. Clearly, mm -hmm. it's some, someone else. Yep. And he begins to address this, address this cherub as the originator of transgression. Right. So let's let's read let's read that. How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, sun of the dawn! You have been cut down to earth, you who have weakened the nations. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. So what's at work there? What do we, what do we recognize with the attitude that this angel, Satan, is reflecting? Pride. Pride. Right. What else? Envy. envy. Stolen authority. Mm -hmm. yeah. Envy. Uh, covetedness, mm -hmm. right? Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, an, an ambition that's not not pure ambition. It's it's greedy. It's it's grabbing for for attention. It's grabbing for power. Right. Right. Go on. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Nevertheless, you will be thrust down to Sheol, to the recesses of the pit. All right. So now, now let's 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 also connect that to Ezekiel chapter twenty-eight. Sure. Fourteen to seventeen. So what do we see here in Satan? He is incredibly self-oriented. Right. He is. He has come to a place in his created state of being where he becomes the point. His own point of reference. Right. And he's no longer focused on God and love of God, which we ought, to, we ought to make a note there, love of God. We'll come back to that in a moment. But his love for God is clearly corrupt. For whatever reason, whatever happened, his creation, his created state was to love and honor God. Mm -hmm. But somehow 
he went awry and it became himself, love of self. You know, there was a, a song in the 70s that the world elevated as the greatest song ever, um, the greatest love. You know, the greatest love of oh, all. Yes. Probably mm -hmm. 80s. Yeah, 80s. Yeah. It was probably late 70s, early okay. 80s. The greatest love of all is to love oneself. Whitney Houston yes. recorded that. Mm -hmm. yeah. was it? Uh, I, it was I think Dolly Parton her. wrote it. I'm not sure. It was done before with No, that Houston. was another song. <laughs> so the greatest love of all is learning to love oneself. That song, even though on the surface you can make all sorts of good humanistic uh, you know, remarks about it, how it, it, you know, we have to have self-esteem, self we have to love ourselves and so on. But when you dig deeper into the song, it's, it's basically reflecting the sin of Satan. Yeah. Love of self above God, beyond God. And this is what we're seeing here. It's really about the self-orientation. From that self-orientation comes all manner of sin. And what, what we're going to see with the fruit of the flesh that Paul talks about is that every one of those sins, the fruit of the flesh, comes from that place of the, of the self-orientation. So let's see what Ezekiel says. You were the anointed cherub who covers, and I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. By the abundance of your trade, you were internally filled with violence and you sinned. Therefore, I have cast you as profane from the mountain of God. And I have destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was filled up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I put you before kings that they may see you. So this is the progenitor, Hasatan, the progenitor of all unrighteousness. Unrighteousness was found in his heart. He was, perfectly, he was a perfectly created being. Perfect. That's what it says. Right. That implies or that states that his love for God was where it should have been. But then unrighteousness was discovered in him. Now, here is a good question mm -hmm. for, for a program at some point that I cannot answer. Someone much greater than me will have to answer this question. <laughs> what happened with this perfectly created just gonna ask angel that... that was the spark, the nucleus of this transference in him where his love for God became love of self. I can't answer that question. No one can answer. Well, I, if someone can, please do. No, no, I was going to ask the same thing because when you got to 15, it says you were w blameless in your ways from the day you were created. Yeah. And then all of a sudden unrighteousness is there. What happened? And that's a good question. You can ask the question, was there a flaw in God's creation? What happened? The best answer I can ever come up with is free will. So, free will. So I know that there are, there are theories out there that part of what caused Satan to fall is the fact that God created us. Yeah, and, and like you said, th those are theories. Right. He was and jealous of man. Or that he thought... I, I could see that, and, and this is all speculation, not mm -hmm. worth anything, yeah. but anyway. There's right. nothing um, in the Bible to support I it. could see that, right. like, for example, if, if, if you, were doing, you were doing great things, right? You, you were, okay, let's say you're running the church and it's great, and then all of a sudden this person comes in and you're starting to, like, be pals with this person, and I think I know better than you and I am kind of trying to protect you. So I could see Satan claiming that, right? In reality, it's like many things. He's fooling himself because it's really about his self-orientation, but his thinking that in, if we were going to use God creating us as a problem, that somehow like God creating us would be like demeaning himself to create, you know, us, literal humans, and that he is trying to, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's a deceiving thing to himself, right? Yeah. Oh, I'm going to protect God because he's doing this crazy thing well, and forgetting there, that he's God. In there you find the, the seed of a rebellious heart, as if God is unable to right. protect himself. Exactly. So don't worry, I'm not going to sell to the Moody's. <laughs> <laughs> I always had, had to be there. <laughs> I always had a difference, yes. 
I always had a different spin on it. I always felt like humanity and this matrix that we dwell, dwell in was created for the purpose of cleaning up the spill. Oh, that's, a, that's an interesting way to put it. But yeah. we, there's no evidence. No. It's, right, it's yeah. purely yeah. speculative. Yeah. Yeah. No. Same with me. <laughs> I, I, think, I think there was a period in the creation, in the creation event, following the creation event, when there was harmony uh, with the angels and with man. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sin was conceived in Satan's heart, and he went after man. Well, that's what the book yes. of Jubilee so, says, right? Right. He Another went after man. He, he determined to cause man to fall. And in doing this, he, I think, and this is all conjecture, I think he determined that if I can get man to obey me, I would be as God. Oh, right. okay. Yeah, that's, uh, that, that's that seems evident. Yeah, that's evident. Because God's greatest desire is that man, and this we'll get back to this point here that I'm about to make again. The greatest commandment of them all is to love, love the God. Lord your God with all your, your heart, heart all your mind, and soul. Right. right. So, so Satan wanted man to love him, to obey him, and so he knew that what God wanted for man was for man to obey him and love him, and then obey him. Love him enough to obey him perfectly. And this is what God wanted from us. Right. Satan, in his rebellious state, determined that if I can get man to obey me, then I will defy God and I will be like God. This is what he wanted, yep. to be like God. And this is the lie he spoke to Eve, right? God is holding back on you because right. he doesn't want you to be like him. Yeah. It's kind of sad to say, but it seems that Satan is the ultimate humanist like in paradise lost he is the ultimate yeah. humanist in paradise lost milton has him saying i would rather rule in hell than serve in heaven right yeah, absolutely he's the ultimate humanist in that he used a very humanistic ploy mm -hmm. to attract eve into that rebellion initially and man as well adam uh, he said what did he say he he lifted up the human being and saying to eve god is lying to you that when you mm -hmm. eat of this fruit, you will be like God. That's right. the that's the that's the pinnacle of the humanistic sentiment, isn't it? Yes. And from that moment on, well, from the time Adam, Eve did not initiate the fall. Adam did. Well, well, Satan did, but the right. fall occurred yeah. when Adam sinned because yeah. the sin was with him, yeah. not with Eve, and so. From that moment on, man begins to manifest this incredible dimension of self-orientation. For instance, in Genesis chapter chapter 3, we see that the man and the woman were naked in the garden, and there was no shame. Right. Immediately following the fall, they're covering themselves. Their self-orientation turns on at a high level to where they're ashamed, conscious of their nakedness and their vulnerability. Now... That was, that was the nature of their sin. And that's mm -hmm. why God covered them with the, with the skin of a, a lamb that was offered up. Uh, so we can, we can go off on that. That's a wonderful tangent to go on. But let's get back to the <laughs> progenitor of the self-orientation, which is sin, Satan. So because of his self-orientation, again, we don't know how that was initiated. What happened? There's an untold story there that we will all hopefully understand at some point. Uh, but but something happened that initiated this self-orientation. It was so powerful that it drove him to cause a rebellion. Now, if you consider the book of Enoch mm -hmm. and some of the extra-biblical writings, it had to do with sensuality, right? Right, uh, yeah. They wanted the daughters of man, and that was the initiation of the rebellion. I, I don't know if that's true. Yeah. I, I don't. To me, it's always, it's, it's always been hard. I can understand a human being not, you know, having the issues that, that humanity has with God because they've never been in the presence of God. But Satan was in the presence of God all the time, the right. most perfect, most powerful being. How, I don't understand how he could have fallen, yeah. right? I, it's, it's, I, I can only point to the angels are created with free will. Mm -hmm. The ability to choose, and he chose, he chose wrong. Um, now, Let's look at what Paul refers to as the fruit of the flesh. And we will see in what Paul talks about in Galatians chapter 5, 19 to 21, the fruit of the flesh, how they all so clearly relate to Satan. And they're not all sensual, to get back to the essence of the question. 
they're not all sensual. A lot of them has, have to do with, with our attitude towards each other, our attitude towards even ourselves, the way we, we relate to ourselves as well. So let's, let's read that, Jim, in Galatians 5, 19 to 21. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarned you, just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. All right, so all of these fruit of the flesh. Now, what's a fruit? What's a fruit? Something that, that initiates from a source. All right? The source of these fruit, of course, is Satan. He originated the, the rebellion and, and the self-orientation. So here are the fruits of that rebellion. Here, here are the fruits of his iniquity, uh, what has come as a result of his sin. So the first one that's mentioned there is immorality. Mm -hmm. So immorality does not only relegate towards what we call sensuality. Immorality can be what we're seeing in our government. Right. I mean, you recognize Corruption. immorality. Yep. Corruption. Uh, and to a sense, there's a sense of sensuality, but not sensuality as it relates to, to, to sexual activity, right? right? So, but corruption, the, the incredible level of corruption that we're seeing in our Congress with what's happening with Nancy Pelosi and her husband and many others. Mm -hmm. uh, what's happening with that particular couple, the Pelosi's, is only indicative of what's much broader. So that's immorality. So we're seeing there the fruit of the flesh in our government. Impurity, well, talk about cannibalism. Impurity, there are all manner of impurities that we can recognize. Sensuality, again, sensuality as it, as it relates to sexuality is a multi-industry, uh, mega-industry type movement, right? Mm -hmm. I yep. mean, from, from, from pornography all the way to uh, Victoria's Secrets, and even in, in our, our regular fashion in music, it's everywhere, it's mm -hmm. pervasive, it's everywhere. Uh, idolatry, oh, idolatry, what about that? That's a fruit of the flesh. Idolatry exists on every plateau. Right. Every plateau of human, of the well, human and experience. Even, even in idolatry, there is that, I want to get my way. Because in reality, most of the idols are, I do this mm -hmm. because I know you're going to give me, I think you're going to give me this, right? right? But it's so commonly accepted that that there's television shows called American Idol. Yep. And you're supposed to idolize these <laughs> I, people. Yes. And that's it's, it's presented as an acceptable as an acceptable action. Right. Idolatry is ingrained into our civilization. Even in Christianity, there is idolatry. Our ministers are demanding that they fly around in Lear jets. Right. Are demanding that they have multiple bodyguards and entourages with them. Are demanding that they are paid exorbitant amounts, amounts of money for their ministry. And the people are going along with it. They're being idolized. Right. Right. Right? There's no yep. question about that. It's everywhere. All right. So, so everything that... Uh, sorcery. Ah, well, of course. Uh, pharmacia, sorcery... Enmities, uh, well, that's everywhere. Strife. Strife exists in the human experience in all levels. Jealousy. Now, what about jealousy? Jealousy is, is I, I, you talk about the, the, the self-orientation. Jealousy would reflect that so clearly. When you think of sorcery, all right, sorcery not so much would reflect the self-orientation, but it does. But jealousy really does. Well, and I would, I would argue that enmity, strife, outburst of anger, disputes, and dissensions are all fruit of jealousy. And right? can be, yes. And factions and as well. Mm -hmm. and factions. And uh, envying, of course, drunkenness. Now, you were talking about the consumption of alcohol uh, as a fruit of the flesh. Mm. So, I, think, I think it would also spill over in our modern world to drug abuse. Right. Drug abuse. Yep. 
and carousing. Carousing. What, mm-hmm. what is it to carouse? To go drinking, mm-hmm. partying, yeah. <laughs> sex. Yeah. Camaraderie. Yeah. Whoremongering as, as they yes, were there you go. <laughs> and so on. All right, so fruit of the flesh. Paul is warning the early believers to stay away from these things because the origin of these things is of, of the devil. Right. right. He's going to contrast that with the fruit of the flesh here in a moment, and we'll take a look at that. So this is the warning that he's given the believers, and this is certainly applicable to us. Um, all of the fruit of the flesh that we just looked at is pretty much standard in every human experience on every plateau today. Even in the church, it True. is. Uh, you know, uh, greediness, um, it's, it's there. It's everywhere. The idea that, uh, you know, again, we have ministers who are demanding that they continue to update their, their layer jets to the finest, the most, the most, the most, you know, the most modern, the most up-to-date jets is what they must have. Why? Because uh, they give all kinds of excuses as to why they have to have these layer jets. But it's really about greed. It's really about, about the self. It's really about flesh. It's really about Satan's sin manifesting through these ministers. And so it's not only in the church, of course, it's everywhere mm-hmm. in the Congress, in the, in the halls of the Congress, the, the, the American people are seeing this. So, now, the struggle concerning this is real. It's a real struggle, and Paul is going to, we're going to read about this struggle. It has to do with the inner man who comes to a place of recognizing the Spirit of God and the will of God as it relates to the Spirit of God by walking in faith. In, in other words, the Spirit of God leads the, the, the believer towards a faith walk, which involves the, the obedience factor and the, the factor of loving God. So we talked about loving God. So, so look at Cain and Abel. You have a good example with Cain and Abel of the flesh and the spirit. Abel, a man of the spirit. He mm-hmm. understood God's, God's heart. He knew that, that his love for God would be expressed as he would offer up that, that, that animal, that approach. So he knew how special, how, 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 how much God wanted that, that communion with man and that blood would have to be shed in order for that approach to happen. Uh, in other words, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. That's the whole idea of the approach. The word approach is sac- where we get the word sacrifice from. So Abel understood that in order to draw near to God and have him draw near to me, there must be this offering, this korban, this approach. And by faith, Abel did this. Right. I think he recognized, at least when I, like for example, when, when we come into worship and, and you know we do everything from the dancing to the singing, I feel like I have to offer everything I have because he's my creator, my maker, my sustainer. And I should be so joyous to have the opportunity to come before him and offer him something, right? Because in reality, we have nothing, right? Right. So, and I think Abel understood that. Abel understood, he, no doubt, he understood what Adam would have shared with him about what God did once the sin occurred, the fall. Mm -hmm. How God himself provided an animal. And that was no doubt an approach in that man can approach him. And, and the idea of the skin of the animal being the, the covering for Adam and Eve is so, the symbolism is so wonderful. A well, covering by blood so that they can approach. And, and I'm putting myself right now in Adam and Eve's spot. Imagine there had never been a death before. Right. All these animals that they had cared for because they were the stewards of yeah. these animals they got and all of a sudden one of these animals has to die because of what because i of did sin, right. that that's just that's a horrible thought right. and then a son rises up yes. against another son right. right not even really a full generation out yeah so now now abel had a right perspective concerning god's heart his love for god and this is the key his love for god and his wantonness to please god to draw near to god led him to make that approach. 
On the other hand, you had Cain, who by the sweat of his brow, who was being faithful to the curse that God had placed upon man, mm -hmm. right? He was being diligent in, in responding to that curse. God said, by the sweat of your brow, you will produce. And Cain was faithful to that. Cain's, Cain's offering, his approach was not evil, was not right. wrong necessarily. It just wasn't what Abel did. So he determined that because of the sweat of my brow, because of all the work I've done, I deserve to be recognized. That's a, that's a classic human trait. And that comes from the devil. It comes from Satan himself. Mm -hmm. Look at me, how wonderful I am. I mm -hmm. have such a wonderful position. I deserve more from humanity. I deserve to be worshipped. And so Cain was convinced that his offering deserved more attention from God because of all the effort that he's put into it. Suddenly, he's in the flesh. Yep. So you have Cain, the man of the flesh. You have Abel, the man of the spirit. Uh, Abel by faith offered up. This is what the writer of the book of Hebrews tell us. Abel by faith offered up a better, a more pure offering to God. So now Paul is going to talk, we're going to see here that Paul's going to make references to this battle that occurs in each of us, the Cain and Abel battle. There's a Cain and Abel battle in every human being. And, and it's possible that our DNA is tied to that experience. And we, we struggle with that Cain Abel reality. The spirit man, the flesh man. So let's, let's read now what Paul says about this struggle in Galatians chapter 5, 16 to 18. But I say, walk by the spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Okay, so he brought the law into focus there because there was an idea that somehow you can please God by keeping the law right. and mm -hmm. be justified by keeping the law. And he was speaking against that. We're not going to get into the issue of the law, right. but... In a very broad and general sense, what we just read is that Paul is clearly denoting that there is this war in each of us. Again, uh, the Cain and Abel battle, the mm -hmm. man of the flesh, yep. the man of the spirit. Uh, and it's real. Yep. It's real in every human being. Uh, also in, in Romans chapter 8, Paul also addresses the issue concerning the natural man, the man of the flesh, the man who walks by, by sight, the one who is, is Cain compared to the spirit man, the man who walks by faith, Abel. Right. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who are according to the flesh see their, set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mind is set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So there's an incompatibility between those who are in the flesh and those who are in the spirit. And there's no way they can merge together. You're either in the flesh or you're in the spirit. That's what Paul is saying. You're, in other words, as it relates to the analogy, you're either Cain or Abel. Mm -hmm. you're, you're, there's no fusion there. You're, we're talking about polarization here. There are two poles, right. right? You're either in the spirit or you're in the flesh. You walk by faith or you walk by sight. You're a natural man or you're a son of God. That's what Paul is getting to. And so this... this battle exists in each of us. Our, 
our objective or our opportunity is to love God. And that's why Paul was talking about the fulfilling of the law. And what's the fulfilling of the law? To love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and your neighbor as yourself. You do this and you fulfill the law. How much of the flesh has to be nailed to the cross in order to fulfill that law? All of all it. Of and it. this is what yep. Paul is driving at. Yep. You know, I wish Paul would have said it as succinctly as I just did, but Paul was a right. lawyer. Right. So <laughs> I like in 7 where it says that the man of the flesh is not even able to do so, uh, right? Absolutely. And, and, and that's emblematic. I think in Cain's mind, he thought, God wants me to do a sacrifice. I'm doing a sacrifice. What more could you want? I right? worked hard all sp yes. spring through the summer. Here's the fall, and right. here's your offering, and you're telling me that he who did nothing yep. but but raise his animals brought a better offering to yeah, you. Yeah, he di he didn't get it at all. Right, and so I was speaking to someone uh, recently about this, and I came up with an analogy. I tend to do this, and yeah. So the analogy I came up with to reflect this is someone commissions two men contractors to build for him a cabin, a, a log house out in the forest. It's something that the, the builder, the person who wanted this, had waited for for a long time. And he hired two contractors, two men that will do it. The first one, he is to build the frame, mm -hmm. uh, complete the exterior of the log home. And the second one is to come along and decorate the interior. And so the first one, he labors. I mean, think about the amount of work that's involved. Mm -hmm. You have to cut these trees down. You got to debark the trees. It's, it's a tremendous amount of work to put up the exterior of this, this log cabin. And he labors at it. And then when he's done with all of the, his work, here comes the interior decorator who brings in some chairs, some tables, <laughs> And the owner of the house now comes along and he gives appreciation to the interior decoration. Right. And what happens? The one who labored... Previously. He's, he's jealous. Right. He's yes. angry to the point of even committing murder, right? That's from a natural standpoint. That's understandable. But the point is this. The owner of the house, the one who commissioned for the house to be built, isn't unappreciative of right. the work that was done. Right. But he understood that the one who decorated the interior of the house knew his mind mm -hmm. and knew what he would desire. Right. It doesn't mean that he didn't like or he didn't appreciate the house. Truth is, he probably did appreciate the building of the house uh, on a different scale. Yep. But that guy took a very selfish perspective. That contractor took a very right. selfish perspective on the interior decorator. That's a great analogy. And that's, that's yeah. how I see the Cain and Abel issue. Well, the man of the flesh is like that contractor who built the log cabin. He demands attention. He demands, uh, and, and he's strong, and he applies mm -hmm. his strength. The spirit man knows the heart of God, knows what God wants because he draws near to God. Why? Because he loves God. He fulfills the law by loving God, and that's the greatest commandment. Right. Greatest right. commandment. Mm -hmm. If you love God, you will know his mind, you will know his heart. Right. And, 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 and like Jesus himself said, if you love God, me, and God, you will obey us. Right. So we obey God because we love him. Right. And when we do this, we're fulfilling the law. You can't have the law without, without obedience, without acts of faith. Right, but our acts of faith must must reflect our love for God. So it comes back to love. Yep. So now the fruit of the spirit. Now, so so the fruit of the flesh comes from that place of transgression, the sin nature, the self orientation, the ego. However, you want to frame it. Now, the fruit of the spirit comes from our love for God, and that's 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 the most important thing about this subject. We love God with all, with, with all of our heart, soul, and mind. So then we obey Him and we reflect the fruit of the Spirit. We're like Abel. We're like Abel. And, and let's look at the fruit of the Spirit. Now we're going to see that the fruit of the Spirit, it begins with love. It begins with love. So let's read, let's read the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is agape. 
Mm -hmm. joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to the Messiah Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. Okay, so the very first of all the fruit of the flesh, and I would say the foremost, is love. Now, we yeah. think, you know, we did, we did a program last week and we talked about love, right? Right. right. Love. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never live it down. <laughs> now that love is, yes, our love for God that reflects through us to other people. And that's right. But your love for God really comes as you love Him. Right. And He then, draw near to me, we, we're the initiators, the initiators of that process, right? Draw near to me, and I in turn will draw near to you. He removed Himself in the garden, right? Mm -hmm. And He determined that man should draw to Him. And in us drawing ourselves to him, we prove our love, our desire for him. Right. And the only way that we can draw to him is by the blood. In this case, the blood of Jesus. So we draw close to him, proving our love. We press in. We go past the gates. We enter into that holy place. We draw close to him by the blood of Jesus, proving our love. And because we prove our love, he loves us. Draw near to me and I will draw near to you. So he loves us. We love him. We know of his love. His love is emanated, is, is, is permeated in us and it reflects. It flows out of us. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's like we become channels. We become conduits of God's love, right. which is to fulfill the law. When Many, many times I've said to God, God, I'm an unlovely person, unloved and unlovable Fill me with your love. Yeah. God, mm -hmm. fill me with the love of yourself. In other words, I'm saying, God, I want to love you more. Fill me with more of the love of yourself. And he does, and it's powerful. And that love becomes who I am. It reflects through me to other people. Right. That's the fulfillment of the law, and that's the fruit of the flesh. The very first of the fruit of the flesh is love. Patience, kindness, all those things will flow as a result of God's law being fulfilled in me because I love him, I know his love for me, and I am loving others because of it. Right. Yep. Which is the first and the second of all the commandments. It's also, you know, it's the distinction between viewing the law like a chore, something you have to do, right. and viewing the law as something that's a benefit that God is giving me as a gift. It's even a hedge of protection. Right. You know him, and so you love him. Yeah. And you love him and you reap, you, you, you know the benefits, the favor, the goodness that comes from loving him and it flows through you. Mm -hmm. That's agape love. That's the love of God. That's what will cause us to walk in the spirit and obey him. Mm -hmm. we, we obey him because we love him, right? When, when a human being comes in contact with the deepest love of God, he wants to please him right. only. Yes. He doesn't want to do anything to separate himself from that oneness, that closeness that he has with God. You know, Paul, speaking of this love in Corinthians chapter 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says, love is patient, love is kind, and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, it's not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffer, does not rejoice with unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hope all things, endures all things. Love never fails. What Paul did in those few verses is that he contrasts love with the fruit of the flesh. Mm. So the, the, ultimate, the ultimate fruit of the Spirit, which is love, is contrast here with the fruit of the flesh. You see it. Love is not, it, love is kind, is not jealous. So kindness in contrast with jealous. Love does not brag, does not seek its own, and isn't arrogant. So he's contrasting love, the fruit of the flesh, with arrogance. Does not act unbecomingly, does not seek its own. So he's, he's nullifying, he's saying that 
the fruit of the spirit nullifies the fruit of the flesh. And then he says, he makes that wonderful statement, love never, never fails. fails. Now that, that's important for us. Because the truth is, when we are in our deepest and our most difficult times, deepest despair and difficult times, that love of God, knowing that God loves us, knowing that, not just knowing it here, but knowing it from the very core of our being, that will never fail us. No matter how difficult the times are, your tribulation, whatever it is we face, knowing that God loves us will never fail us. So that's, that's critical. And so what does the Holy Spirit have to do with this? The Spirit, of course, the Spirit of God in us brings us to that awareness, to the, to, to the, to the place where we can love God. When, when we're born again, we're filled with the Holy Spirit, do we automatically have this great love relationship with God? No, it doesn't happen like that. We have to grow into that. Mm -hmm. We have to pursue it. Even someone who is baptized in the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, you think of uh, Saul, King Saul in the Bible. Uh, the Holy Spirit was upon him. Right. He had that experience, but he didn't love God. He didn't right. obey God. He was baptized in the Spirit. I marvel. That, right. I marvel at what he experienced and that he walked away from it. There's yep. even a hint there that he was in tongues. Right. <laughs> yes. Right. Language. Yes. Nevertheless, he didn't love God. He didn't obey God. Right. He didn't express his love for God mm -hmm. at all, and therefore he didn't love God. Uh, so you can be baptized in the Holy Spirit, yeah, but never experience that, that drawing close to God experience. Many Pentecostals, I think, exist in that place. Being baptized in the Holy Spirit stages us in a place where we can then proceed to draw to God and to know that deep, intimate love. That what is it? What's the baptism? What is the greatest effect of the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Well, knowing God in the Spirit of God, right? Hearing His voice, knowing mm -hmm. that that voice that you heard, yeah, that's God. Mm -hmm. Being able to distinguish between the voice of the natural man, and the voice of the Spirit yep. man, that's the the major effect of the baptism of the Spirit. Uh, it's a benefit in that sense. It's an empowerment. Jesus said it's an empowerment, and so the voice of the Holy Spirit speaks to us, moves in us to direct us as to what is God's will, right? The will of God. And the will of God is for us to love Him with all of our heart, soul, and mind, and to surrender ourselves to that love. And when we do, we bear the fruit of the Spirit. We bear the fruit of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit even gives us gifts that are for the equipping of the saints. Right. To equip us. Right. To serve God. So that, that, of course, is a very clear objective of God and giving us the Holy Spirit. But there's also the fruit of the Spirit that we see in Jesus. We see the gifts of the Holy Spirit working in Jesus. Right. We see the fruit working in Him. Paul spoke about the mystery of Messiah, which is the Spirit of Messiah in the midst of His people, in the midst of His congregation. Well, when the Spirit of Messiah is in us, you see the fruit of the Spirit. Right. Right? Uh, and and when the when and ah so when you're in the midst of the congregation, a body of believers where the fruit of the spirit is, the fruit of the spirit are being manifest, and someone comes along and begins to manifest the fruit of the flesh, what happens? Oh, it's so there's obvious. an immediate recognition. Yep. Shut down. <laughs> yep, immediate. <laughs> there's an immediate and instant recognition mm -hmm. and, and and shut down. Or if leadership is careful, will work to nullify. Well, right. right. And be able to continue and right. press on. Yeah. So that's the reality of, you know, you, the question is a wonderful question. It brings out so many other points. But the main point is living by the Spirit of God and walking according to the Spirit of God, which is what Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 25. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. So that's, that's the final admonishment. If you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you live by it and you walk by it. Right. Yep, absolutely. No, I was just going to say that in Tolkien's the, So Marilyn, I, I know not a lot of people I'm have read that. I'm not familiar with that one. Yeah, that, that one is, is really tough reading. At the beginning, What's God, the So Marilyn. So Marilyn. Yeah, it's supposed to be. So at the beginning, God creates a 
wonderful composition and all the angels are singing it and it is beautiful and then in essence satan and of course they've got names because they're fairies and all that right they're they're elves satan arises and begins to introduce his own music mm. into it and it causes total disruption right and god's well aware of it but he's allowing it for a certain period of time and that's like when having somebody walk into a congregation that is manifesting the fruit of the spirit there's so much unity and harmony going on and then all of a sudden this person comes in who's totally off the flesh and just sends everything yeah, right. know, south. we've seen that quite a few times yeah. too, many, too many times yes <laughs> we've seen it a number of times and it's hideous when it comes mm -hmm. now the real sad truth about that phenomena is that those people that come in and they would manifest the fruit of the flesh they're not sent for that purpose. They're sent to be delivered from, mm. the, from, the, from the strength of the flesh. But they choose, here's the free will, here is the sin of Satan. They choose to embrace the natural. They choose to embrace the flesh. And when they do, it would usually come to a boiling point and boom, there's, there is a confrontation, there is, there is an, an affronting of spirits it's that contest, con, con, con contest that Paul spoke about, the flesh and the spirit, and boom, it happens, overtly manifested, and one will go and one will stay. And it's, it's so bad for new people who don't understand up right. from down because it often drags them out the door too. Yep. Unfortunately, there is always collateral damage. Right. Mm -hmm. Always. Right. So. Well, that's our program, and... If this uh, question has raised other questions in your mind, you are at liberty to share them with us. You can email us at voice at buildupzion.org. Again, that's voice at buildupzion.org. We're hosting a meeting this Sunday night. That's August 7th uh, at 7 o'clock. Uh, here with Rabbi uh, Jeremy Gimpel from Gan Arugot in the uh, region of Tekoa in southern Israel. And uh, we're looking forward to that meeting. You're welcome to join us if you so choose. And until next week, Shalom.